Sean Rain, Managing Director of China Market Research Group, will kick us off after the afternoon tea break. We'll see you shortly. Perfect. Well, I am so excited to be here today. So thank you to Steve, Paula, and the conference team for inviting me. What I was asked to do today was to have some fun by challenging you all to think about what's happening in China today, what that means for your New Zealand, what it means for your companies, and what it means directly for you as CFOs, because China's economy is changing quickly. The growth model of the last three decades in the country, where the country relied on cheap labor and manufacturing and export-led growth, is over. When you look at it, instead of the 10% growth that we've been getting the last three decades, we're now down around 6.5%, 7%. There's too much pollution in the country. There's so much capital outflows. If you look at it, $100 billion per month have been leaving the country over the last three months. So what does the country need to do? How is this going to affect you all in New Zealand? Well, the first thing is Prime Minister Lee Keqiang is trying to push services. He's trying to push consumption, and importantly, he's looking at innovation. And it's starting to work. When you look at it, right now services account for 68% of China's economy. Over 50% of GDP growth last year came from consumption. And the main thing is innovation. This is what the country is talking about on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I want to do today is challenge you to think, is innovation happening in the country today? And if so, in what sectors? And if not, what are the challenges? So I'm basing this off my last book called End of Copycat China, where I went out and I interviewed the top CEOs of the top startups and big technology companies in China. So I want to start by asking you all a question based off of Vice President Joe Biden from the United States. He says, but I challenge you, name me one innovative project, one innovative change, one innovative product that has come out of China. So let me ask you, do you think China is innovative? Or do you think it's not? A lot of people say a communist country with censorship cannot be innovative. What do you all think? Does anybody have any ideas? Is China innovative? Sorry, what? Tell me more. They're disrupting mobile technology in what way? Sorry? Foxconn. Oh, Xiaomi. OK, Xiaomi is a Chinese handset maker. And they're starting to disrupt because they're selling most of their products directly online, right? Perfect. What do other people think? Is China innovative or not? And if not, why not? Well, let me ask you it this way. If you think China is innovative, please raise your hand. So about 20% of the room. If you don't think China is innovative, please raise your hand. So about 10% of the room. So that means 70% of the room has no idea if China is innovative or not. Great. So we're going to try to change that, because as CFOs, you need to understand what's really happening in the country. When you look at China over the last 30 years, it really hasn't been that innovative. Whenever I ask audiences in China, is China innovative, a Chinese person is going to stand up. And he says, China is innovative. We invented gunpowder. Other people stand up and say, we invented the compass. And still others, especially if they're CFOs or in finance, say, we innovated banknotes. But if you think about it, all of these inventions or innovations were done hundreds, if not thousands, of years ago. Why hasn't China been innovative in the last 30 years? If you think about it, it's kind of a very similar trend to what happened in the United States or what happened in Japan in the 1960s and 1970s. Take a look at Charles Dickens, author. He says, I spoke, as you know, of international copyright. My blood so boiled as I thought of the monstrous injustice. Dickens wasn't talking about the Chinese. He was talking about the Americans. Because the Americans in the 19th century essentially copycatted, transferred technology, and stole technology from Western Europe to build the 
economic superpower that we now know. This is very similar to Japan in the 1960s and 1970s with Sony or the Koreans. So China is at a very similar stage. It didn't make sense to try to be innovative over the last 30 years. It was much easier to put up a tall building and become a billionaire, or it was easy to get a deal with a government ministry. Now, I have a friend who opened up a restaurant in Beijing, heart of the city. He got free rent for 20 years from the government. Okay? It would be like getting a restaurant right on the waterfront in Auckland. Best property, best land, free rent 20 years. He was making 10 million US dollars a year in profit off this 750 person restaurant. His client base, 90% of it were government officials. And they would spend three, 4,000 US dollars a night to eat at his restaurant. So if you can do a business like that, why would you even consider being innovative? But there are other challenges to innovation over the last 30 years in China. The first is IP protection. Now, have you all heard of Subway Sandwiches? Yeah, there's one right next door here. So Subway Sandwiches is a big chain, if you don't know it. Um, it's, there's about four or 5,000 points of sale in China. It's big, and it's something that Chinese love because they consider it healthy, okay? So I used to eat at the Subway restaurant once or twice a week for 10 years next to my office in downtown Shanghai because I considered it safe. So one day, we had the head of business development for Subway in China apply for a job with my company. And I was really excited. I was thinking, this guy built up one of the most successful franchisees for a Western company in China over the last 20 years. And we interviewed him, and we're like, how did you build up so well? And he looked at us, and he goes, well, actually, we only have eight or 10 subway outlets in China. Eight or 10, but there's thousands of them all over the place. He said, no, no, no. They're all pirated subway sandwich shops. So a comp some Chinese entrepreneur, he is an entrepreneur, just set up this company and stole everything from subway. The signs, he stole the menus, he stole the ingredients. He stole everything down to the two free cookies you would get if you would eat at Subway. And so we said, wait a minute, this is ridiculous. How come Subway didn't sue? And the executive said to us, well, yes, we actually did sue. And every single year, we win. I was like, well, wait a minute, what, what do you mean by that? Well, the IP protection laws in China are quite good. The judgments by the courts are quite good. The problem is in the enforcement. One of the big issues with IP protection, and we see it with Subway, is in year one, when Subway won, they made them take away the Y on the sign. When they sued him again, they had to take away the U. So instead of Subway, S-U-B-W-A-Y, it was S blank W blank A Y. So one of the biggest problems in China today about innovation is the fear of intellectual property. There's still concerns that somebody is gonna steal your technology, and even if the government believes in you and forms a right judgment, you won't be able to get money. Now, this is starting to change. The reason is because a lot of the domestic Chinese juggernauts, companies like Huawei, Tencent, Alibaba, are starting to lose a lot of money because they're actually starting to become innovative. This is very similar to what happened with the Japanese. They were known as counterfeit nation until the domestic brands like Sony started to lose money. So what the government in Shanghai has done is they've created last year their very first intellectual property court. And they now actually have not just the judgment power, but also the enforcement power. So the first thing that's a problem is starting to change with IP protection. The second major challenge is regulation. What do I mean by this? Does anybody know who this is? I know you guys are serious CFOs, but you must watch TV as well sometimes. And it's, don't worry, it's not the CEO or the board here, so you won't get in trouble for saying you know who this is. Does anybody know who this is? Okay, thank you. Who is it? Penny. Did she, that she got married, right, and she changed her name, so you're really on top of things. <laughs> okay, didn't she just get married on the show like last week or something? Okay, so Penny, now can you tell, this is a show called Big Bang Theory, OK? 
Okay? It's very popular in the United States. It's hugely popular in China. A company called Sohu.com paid millions of dollars to air this in China online. They had 240 million downloads. 240 million. This show is a comedy. It's about a couple lovable geeks okay, who love Star Trek, who love Star Wars, and they're a professor at Caltech, and they have a beautiful neighbor. It is apolitical. There's almost no sex in it. It's just a pure funny comedy. Anybody know this show? Yeah, more heads go up and down. So I see what you guys like. This is Game of Thrones, okay? For those of you who don't know Game of Thrones, it's all about sex. There's nudity, there's whoring, there's political intrigue. There's one kingdom fighting another kingdom, one brother killing his stepsister. This is everything that the Chinese government doesn't like, political instability. This show is also one of the most popular shows in, t in China today. But what's the difference? Last year, Big Bang Theory got banned in China. Pure comedy. While Game of Thrones is shown on CCTV, the state-owned television station. Why? Now, when you think about it, it's not about censorship. CCTV shows Game of Thrones. But the rumor is, is they wanted to air Big Bang Theory and they didn't like having a private Chinese company making all that kind of money. So Big Bang Theory was blocked in China for a year until the Sohu and a lot of people pushed and pushed to finally allow Sohu to air it legally. But the point is, a lot of entrepreneurs in China are scared of doing business because they're worried that the state-owned enterprises or the government will come in, like CCTV did, and say, I want this business. So one of the barriers to doing innovation in China, if something takes five years, 10 years of investment, of R&D, if you do something well, the big fear is that the state is gonna come in and grab your company or grab your business, because that hurt Sohu dramatically over the last year since they lost the Big Bang Theory. So when you look at it, over the last 30 years, the first challenge towards innovation in the country, aside from being the normal economic development, was IP protection, censorship, and the third is education. The education system in China is an absolute mess. It's all based on rote memory, and that's why you see so many Chinese now are going to the University of Auckland, or they're coming into Australia or the United States to study, because they're not getting the enrichment and the creative thinking needed for innovation in the country. I'll give an example. I met recently with the head or a head professor of a technology department at Zhejiang University in China, one of the best universities in the country. And I asked him, what are your big challenges as a professor? And he told me that his biggest problem is that right now he's teaching a 5,000 person class. I said, 5,000 students? Like that's a lot of, how many sections do you have? What do you have to do, go in 10 times a day? He said, no, 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 no. I teach 5,000 students at one time. The kids are all brought in through closed circuit TV. So big problems for China today is the education system. It means great opportunities for educational institutions in New Zealand, but it's also gonna create massive pain within your organizations if you have offices in China because the efficiency of a Chinese worker is probably only about a quarter of that of an American or a German worker on, in the blue collar side, and probably only half that on the white collar side. So the three big challenges for innovation over the last 30 years in China has been IP protection, it has been education, and literal outright fear of the state. Now, I've painted a pretty negative picture on the economy today and the status quo, but why am I one of the bigger bulls in the country? So let's take a look at what's happening in China today and how it's changing. The first is the China dream. This is a really important concept for New Zealand companies to understand. After President Xi Jinping became president three years ago, he tried to create, or he did create, a national discourse on what does it mean to be Chinese. 
The result is that Chinese started to say, we want Chinese brands made by Chinese for Chinese. It's rising nationalism. Right now, Chinese want to become and feel they are the next global economic and maybe political superpower. So no longer do Chinese want to slavishly look to Western Europe or the United States for their aspirations. Now, obviously, not all New Zealand companies can become Chinese, but you have to understand how to connect with the Chinese consumer. And now I'm going to show you a couple slides of advertisements that work and don't work. The first is this by Ralph Lauren. Okay? Chinese consumers account for about 50% of global luxury sales. Ralph Lauren has never done well selling to the Chinese consumer. Why not? Well, take a look at this ad. It's a beautiful advertisement, and when we show Chinese consumers this, they say we love it. The problem is, the girl has blonde hair and blue eyes. This is not an image that we as Chinese women can aspire to. We have black hair, shorter legs, we're shorter, thinner up top. It's not an image that we can aspire to. So as a CFO, you need to be looking at how your company is representing itself in the Chinese market. You should try to localize. Now here's an example of a company, Gap, that has also tried to localize. But they made some mistakes. They didn't localize in a way that Chinese understand. Does anybody know who this black person is? Who is it? You're raising your hand. Pharrell. Pharrell. Great. So Pharrell is a, a singer. He's clean cut. I think he's married. He's a family man. He's a great guy. He's the one who did the happy song in Despicable Me. He's wonderful. But when this went out, Chinese people had no idea who Pharrell was. What did they see? And you can't see it at the top here, but he's got green hair. And on his arms, it's tattoos. In China, Chinese equate tattoos with triads, gangsters. So when we showed this image out to Chinese girls, they were very scared. They said, I'm not going to buy Gap clothes if these clothes are going to attract the black gangbangers to run after me and hold me in what they viewed as a very aggressive posture. This image didn't work. But let's look at another one, North Face. North Face is known for hiking up wintry uh, peaks. This advertisement is one of the best advertisements I've ever seen in the country today. When you look at the wording, it says, this, take these clothes to travel with you around the world. And we're going to get into this, why this is important in a few slides. But for North Face, if you look at it, they've got cityscapes, they've got climbing mountains, they even have rhinoceroses. You normally don't think of North Face and African animals. But this conception is fitting what the Chinese dream is. It's not the same North Face images that you get in America, where it's a husky, strong white male climbing up something. They're not using any images except for what the Chinese new dream is. Another example would be Gap Kids. So I criticize Gap adults because they use the wrong images. But Gap Kids is one of the most popular clothing brands in the country today. You see they have redheads, they have blondes, they have blacks, they have Asians, they have everything. And Chinese consumers really like this because they feel this kids all have same body shapes. Kids are kids. It doesn't matter what hair color or skin color they are. They want something that everybody around the world is using. So the first important thing to understand as a CFO in your planning is that China is becoming far more nationalistic. It's becoming far more pro-Chinese brands. So for instance, five years ago, I run a market research firm. We interview 5,000 consumers in 15 cities every year. Five years ago, when we asked people in China, do you prefer foreign brands over Chinese brands? 80%, 80% of consumers we interviewed said they prefer foreign brands. Last year, when we ran the same survey, we found 60% said they prefer domestic Chinese brands. That's a big shift in just five years. So you either have to go into China with local brands, or you have to create the relevant aspiration for Chinese consumers today. 
Just saying you're a global brand, putting beautiful blonde hair, blue-eyed people on your advertising is no longer going to cut it. The next change in China is individualism. What we're starting to see is a shedding of the old Confucian norm of everybody wanting to be the same as everyone else. And part of this was due to fear. I'll give a great example. I don't know if you've heard of Xenia, the menswear company. They've got a nice outlet on Queens, Queens Road. They're a high-end menswear company, and they used to control about 70% of the market. What they used to do is they were smart. They understood that most Chinese 10 years ago who were rich were poor just five years before. They were essentially pig farmers. So a lot of the Chinese then bought based off of fear. They didn't know what to buy, so they would buy the same brands as everybody else around them because they didn't want to look stupid. So you had companies like Omega Watches control 70% of the market, Mont Blanc Pens 70%, Louis Vuitton 70% in luxury handbags. So Xenia was smart. In their mannequins, they would put the shoes, the socks, the pants, the shirt, the tie, the handkerchiefs, the jackets, everything. Because most of their consumers would walk into the store and say, I want that mannequin, I want that mannequin, I want that mannequin, and I want that mannequin. Because Chinese were driven by fear. But what we've started to see in the last three years is Chinese consumers are becoming more individualistic. They want to express themselves differently. And that's why when you take a look at it, a lot of the bellwether brands in China, okay, the Burberries, the Pradas, are facing serious problems in the luxury space. So what's happening is the wealthy consumers are trading up, and they're going to say Chanel, which they still consider to be a niche brand. Or they go something really cheap, and they might buy something from New Zealand or South Africa from an ostrich leather company that no one's ever heard of before. I was just in South Africa two weeks ago for a speech, and my brother-in-law, who's from Beijing, he's Chinese, said, Sean, please buy me as many crocodile and as many ostrich belts and accessories that you can, because he wanted to have something different than every other person around him in Beijing. So the next trend is the dominant big brands are going to face serious trouble, and it's the niche brands that are going to do well. Part of this is due to pollution. If there's one word that I want you all to remember from this speech, it's the word pollution. It's really hard to explain how bad it is in China today. I'll give an example. In December, 50% of my son's outdoor recesses at school were canceled because of pollution. 50%. Whenever I take my son outside to the U.S. or South Africa and we go back home, he cries. Because it's gray, if, if we're lucky, most likely black air. And this bl black sky changes how Chinese think. It changes what they're spending their money on by category, how they're spending money. For instance, we've tracked that e-commerce is booming in China, in large part because of pollution. On bad pollution days, e-commerce sales go up. In the United States, about 10, 15% of retail sales are done online. In China, it's about 30%, and we're expecting it to hit 50% in the next five years because Chinese don't want to go outside and shop. They want to cocoon themselves at home. Who wants to go to a brick and mortar department store if you have to deal with the dirty air? It's much easier to click a button on your mobile phone and have a delivery come to you. Pollution changes how we live our day. I'll give a personal example. So I live about a five-minute walk away from my son's school. He's eight years old. And the first thing we do in the morning is my wife and I look at our phones and look at our uh, smart apps to take a look at the air pollution index. If it's clean enough, my son and I will ride our bikes to school. If not, I will have to drive him. Again, we live five minutes away walk from his school. At around 11 a.m., my wife and I will coordinate again. We'll say, how bad do we think the air is going to be in the afternoon? If it's bad, then I'm going to have to leave work and come and pick up my son from school. If it's okay, we're going to call his basketball coach and say that Tom will go and play with him outdoors. If not, we're going to cancel. At 2.30, my wife and I communicate again for final check about the pollution. So the pollution is something that impacts Chinese 
literally on an hour by hour basis, which is a wonderful opportunity for New Zealand and Australia. Probably both nations have the absolute best image globally of any two countries to Chinese consumers. They consider you clean, safe, trustworthy. And this is gonna impact the type of business that you can sell into China today. Now going on with pollution, it's also shifted how Chinese are thinking. Consumers are saying, who cares if I can buy a Louis Vuitton or Burberry bag if the water in the air is gonna kill me? So what started to happen is people are moving away from not just luxury, but physical items. And they're moving more towards services, more towards experiences. They want to see the world. They want to buy kiwis. Now, frankly, I didn't even, until two days ago, I had never heard of the kiwi bird. I thought you were named after kiwi fruit. And most Chinese think the same. This business is absolutely booming in the country. Because what's happened is the rich people say, I'm going to either leave the country and buy a house in Auckland or somewhere in, in New Zealand. But if we're going to stay in China, we want to be as healthy as possible. So they're spending a lot of money on non-processed food. Okay? So the Nestle's, the Unilever's of the world are getting killed. Because if you have money, you're buying kiwis. You're buying supplements. You're buying Manuka honey. And it's so cheap here. You get a little bottle of Manuka honey for like 100 New Zealand dollars for, what is it, the UMF 30. In China, it goes for three, $400. So I've been buying tons of it here and putting it in my suitcase. I'm thinking about reselling it in China. But a lot of people are doing that. And that's why you see so many Chinese. They go into Melbourne. And Melbourne, I think, has been really well set up for this. They've got these stores that, just have, that are clearly geared towards Chinese. They'll have buy five, get one thing of Manuka honey. For your kids, buy these supplements. For the wife, buy this for the hair. Because Chinese are spending their money on quality of life issues. The pollution is so bad in China, this is where people are spending their money. The other thing that's driving both pollution, but also then innovation, is urbanization. When I first moved to China in the 1990s, about 30% of the country was urbanized. Right now, the number is at 51%. And the government has set a 60% urbanization rate in the next decade. What this means is hundreds of millions of Chinese are now moving to urban areas for the first time living in modern homes. They want white goods. Okay? They want the air conditioners. They want the TVs. There's huge opportunities in this sector. But specifically, what's happening in urbanization is two things. The first is people are scared of the air. So the most um, up-to-date real estate developers are buying or, buy, uh, or actually creating the most clean technology in the world because what they want to be able to tout in their office buildings is we have clean air and this is something they actually say to potential tenants we've got the best filtration systems or we have the best solar panels and this is going to create better quality of air for your kids or it's going to create better quality of air for your workers so they're going to be happy and willing to stay in the office longer. What urbanization is also doing is a lot of location-based mobile apps. So for instance, in groceries, that failed in e-commerce in the United States because it was too expensive for one delivery guy to go to one home and then drive another 20 minutes to another. In China, the scope of the housing is, is incredible. In my old living compound, there was eight buildings 60 stories tall all put together. So what that means is you have location-based delivery guys who are able to deliver to 50 or 100 families their groceries in 15, 20 minutes. So this urbanization is really driving a lot of adoption and a lot of innovation of new technologies. The next area is the corruption crackdown, which I'll speak very briefly on. But the corruption crackdown in China is real. It's happening. If you read the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, they say it's all factional fighting. It's not. Right now, Xi Jinping, the president, is trying to reinvigorate the Communist Party. And so he is arresting people right and left. What this has done is two things. The first is the country is in economic paralysis. Nobody's willing to green light a big project. We interviewed hospitals recently, the 50 largest ones in the country. They said they have a budget and a demand for medical equipment. But nobody is willing in the procurement departments to make a purchase. 
because they're scared of being fingered for corruption and getting arrested. This is heavily impacting China's GDP growth, I think, a lot more than people realize. The second reason is a lot of companies are going out of business. So remember my friend who I said was making 10 million US dollars a year with his one restaurant? He went out of business last year. The government banqueting disappeared. What that means is the companies that are still in existence are trying to move up the value chain. They're trying to focus on worker productivity, but more importantly, they're trying to go up the value chain in production. They're trying to become more innovative because if they don't, they're gonna go out of business. Gone are the days of the low-hanging fruit. So what this means for New Zealand is you now have Chinese tourists five years ago lined up at Louis Vuitton. Now they want to go to Egypt. Now they want to go hiking. Right now, the new luxury in China is not driving a BMW or toting a Louis Vuitton bag. It's going traveling. It's coming to New Zealand and then showing off on WeChat, which is a mobile phone app, like social media, and showing off to your friends, hey everybody, I just went to New Zealand. How cool am I? The demand for this is so high that, and the pressure that during Chinese New Year now, which is the big sort of tourism time in China, photography companies have set up fake vacations because people feel so much pressure to go farther and farther away that they can't afford it. So these photography shops are saying, come here and we'll pretend that we went to New Zealand or we'll pretend that we went to South Africa. But one of the biggest trends going forward is tourism. People want to try something different and importantly, they want clean air. Whenever my family, every Chinese New Year, my wife is from Beijing, we take the extended family. Every year we go somewhere different. They want something clean air and exotic. This year, we went to Botswana. Last year, we went hiking in the Grand Canyon. The year before, we went to South Africa. Every year, they want to do something different to show off on WeChat moments. It kind of hurt my wife because when we went to Botswana, we went to a lodge that was like 5,000 US a night, so we thought it would be super luxurious. It wasn't. They didn't have internet and they didn't have phone. So my poor wife for nine days was unable to share or show off her pictures of going to Botswana. So what she did was she put it all in scroll and the day we landed back in, in, in an internet accessible place, everything went up. She, got, she, she ended up doing a lot of speeches on it to her friends because they wanted to know about exotic places. So, what I said when I started was I wanted to challenge you to think about what's happening in China's macro and consumer economy and then what's happening with innovation. So I showed that there's some very serious challenges to innovation in the country today. But I also showed that the macroeconomic changes and the consumer changes are pushing for innovation. People want best of breed technology, whether it be in environmentally friendliness, whether it be in shopping, whether it be in traveling around the world and being able to share what they've done. And that's pushing innovation in the country today. So I like to break it down that innovation in a country is in three stages. The first is the low hanging fruit stage. That's where China really was from 1978 until about 2012. It was easy to make money, like my friend, the restaurateur. But then what we've started to see is the innovation for China stage. And that's really where we are today. You have these fabulous Chinese companies like Alibaba, Huawei, Tencent, that understand the push for the China dream. They understand what Chinese consumers want, and they're delivering it to them. For the most part, these companies would not exist internationally. Okay? You've got these incredible food delivery apps where people can order on an app, you see a delivery guy will look at his location and deliver something quickly. This is not a business that could work in New Zealand because you don't have the density of population. So there's, there's I can name a hundred extremely innovative companies that I've never seen anywhere else in the world, but it just won't become global players. Now, it's also important to define in many ways what innovation is. I think you need to differentiate between the term innovation and invention. And let's look at what Steve Jobs is. Steve Jobs from Apple was considered one of the greatest innovators of all time. But he never invented anything. 
He didn't invent the PC. He didn't invent the mobile phone. He didn't invent the MP3 player. What he did was take existing technology, improve on it, and re meet unmet chi consumer demands. That's what the Chinese have been doing in China. But stage three, in the next few minutes, is what I want to go over, where I see invention, or innovation for the world from Chinese companies. And this is going to help you understand where you're going to face more competition going forward, or where you might see Chinese companies want to buy your companies going forward. Because Chinese are very different from the Japanese of the 1980s. The Chinese are very aggressive, they're very ambitious, and they want to become innovation powerhouses now. They're not calm like the Japanese who want to go up incrementally. The Chinese are willing to make an acquisition to get the technological know-how. So the three sectors that we're seeing the most true global potential for innovation would be in industrialization would be the first. Now, when you think of China, people often think that of its huge population, 1.4 billion people. So it has a limitless supply of cheap Chinese labor. But as my first book, End of Cheap China, showed, China's not a cheap place to produce anymore. Salaries, even in the weak economy and the blue-collar side, are going up 10 15% annually. Real estate rents are also going up about 15% annually. We, my firm has estimated it's only 20% cheaper to manufacture in China than in the United States. And so if you're going to manufacture in China, it's because of the ecosystem. It's not because of price. What's happened in China is light industry, shoes, clothes, toys, have pretty much all moved to Vietnam, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, even some are going to Africa now. What's happening in China is they're moving up the value chain. Aerospace is really hot. You see Airbus, Boeing are both building some of the best factories in the world there. But what it means is China's too expensive. So companies are starting to automate. You can only go so far in worker efficiency, because as we mentioned, the education system in China is not great. So right now, automation in China grew 58% last year. It's the number one user of industrial robots in the world. We expect automation to continue as the aging population and the expensive workforce continue to smack the industrial sector. So robots are really hot in the country. You see companies like Sani, which is a heavy construction equipment maker. When we, five years ago, if we interviewed buyers of excavators, they used to say they would buy Sani because it was cheap but good enough. Now when we interview buyers, they say they're buying Sani because it's as good if not better than the Americans and the Germans. And so companies like Sani are making acquisitions. They're buying top breed, smaller companies in Germany in construction. You're seeing Terex, um, which is a big American one, is now being bought up by Zoom Lion. So one of the things that you all are going to have to face, depending on the technology that your companies have, is you're going to become an acquisition target by the Chinese if you have innovative technology. Because these companies have a lot of money from the low-hanging fruit era, and they understand that they have to change. And so they're making acquisitions around the world. That's why almost every day you see a big Chinese conglomerate making a $1 billion, $2 billion, $5 billion acquisition um, basically to get technology, like Geely, who bought Volvo. Drones are another big thing. DJI is the world's largest consumer drone company with a highest valuation of about $8 billion. What they're doing with drones in China is amazing. They're using it for our agriculture and for some public security instability issues. But there aren't that many rules governing drones in the country. So people are just using it, and the government hasn't caught up with implementing laws. But drone is a big area going forward, both on the play consumer side, but also on the workforce. The second sector that's really hot when it comes to innovation is, as he said, in, is mobile services. A couple reasons for this. The first, there are about 900 million mobile phone users in China. 70% of them access the internet from the mobile phone. Most Chinese do not regularly use the internet from a PC. And a huge percentage have actually never gone onto the internet from a PC. 
What this means is China's taking a mobile first strategy. Whenever I go to the United States or Europe, I always feel I'm two or three years behind the country, behind when it comes to mobile services. There's services like WeChat in China where you can buy stocks, you can order taxis, you can live your entire life on WeChat. It's like an app within an app. When I turn on the phone, I don't even go to anything except for WeChat first. It's a communication tool, it's everything. One of the reasons why this is doing so well is because of the demand, like I said, 70% of 900 million people. The second reason is to do an app only takes two or three months and maybe three people to build it. What that means is you don't have the fear of intellectual property issues and you don't have a fear of the state coming in like what happened with Soho and Big Bang Theory. So a lot of the world's greatest minds are going into mobile apps. The last reason why mobile is so big is if you think about it, most of the Western technology companies, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, were built in a PC environment, and they tried to port it over to a mobile phone, and it doesn't work very well. The Chinese are building mobile apps with the mobile phone, smartphone in mind from the very beginning. Like, I love LinkedIn, okay? I love it, but I have to use a PC and I have to use the mobile phone on it because the tools are not the same. You'll never find that with the Chinese apps. And the final sector, it's not showing up, the final sector is health, biotechnology and healthcare. Probably the most optimistic Chinese entrepreneurs today are in biotechnology and healthcare. For one reason is you have Chinese are getting wealthier, the, the insurance sector in China is a mess, so what people are starting to do is they're paying out of their pocket for better health care. But most importantly is the government is actively supporting biotech. So Zhang Zemin, the former president of the country, his son has created Shanghai Tech, a new university kind of like Cal Caltech and Big Bang Theory. And what they're telling entrepreneurs is you can use our professors, you can use our equipment, you can use our students and resources for free because we're trying to promote biotech. And when you look at it, there's a three, four year lineup in order to take a company public in China. But the government is creating a biotech board where you can IPO very quickly and without the profits and the bureaucracy that you need to go into the A-share market in China. Biotech is hot. It's also something that doesn't threaten political stability. So the government is very supportive of it. So I started off today by saying I wanted to challenge you to think about what's happening in China. There's a lot of fears about an economic slowdown in the country. A lot of the reported numbers from a company like Burberry's are definitely bad. But part of the reason for that is because consumers are shifting their spending habits away from the bellwether physical item companies, more towards experiences, more towards skydiving, more towards scuba diving. The second thing that you need to think about and remember is there's definitely a shift. The industrial sector is in trouble because of the high cost of labor, hence automation. But there's definitely a push, and it's very real, moving towards services and consumption. Are we at the stage where China is an innovation nation? Absolutely not. But it's starting to happen. The government is supportive of it. The macroeconomic levers are supportive of it. And most importantly, the Chinese consumers are. So over the next five to 10 years, you're gonna see massive innovation coming out of China, and that could provide opportunities or serious challenges for you in New Zealand as CFOs of companies. So thank you so much for having me here. I hope this was useful for you. I have a few minutes to answer any questions you might have, but thank you very much. Thanks, um, Sean, a, a fascinating presentation. I'll, I'll just, uh, kick one off, uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, the whole pollution thing. When I, I worked in the tourism 15 years ago. I never in my wildest dreams thought that we'd be promoting New Zealand as a place you could come to to breathe fresh air. But, but I mean, how's that going to have to change? Because obviously, or, or will it? I mean, how, you, you cannot continue to, to see China's air get worse and worse in the way it is at the moment. Good question. I think when I, this is my first trip to New Zealand. So the first thing I did when I landed is I saw the sky and I sent a note to my wife. We have to come here on vacation in April or buy a house because the sky is so blue and the air, you can breathe it because in China we can chew it. 
because it's so bad. Now, the government understands this is a serious problem, and so they're now starting to close high water usage, heavy water polluting companies. The problem, if when you look at it, average GDP per capita in Japan and the United States hit 10 to 15,000 US when they hit their worst pollution numbers. In China, we're only at around 6,000. So even if the government is trying to implement better safeguards, the problem is you just have so many people who are still trying to eat, who are trying to lead a better life. And so I don't think the situation is going to be solved anytime soon. What that means is that's why there's so much capital flight. So many Chinese are moving to Australia or New Zealand, not because they don't like the Chinese government, not so much because of the economy, but they want a better quality of life for their families. That's the first thing. If you can't go abroad, what it means is you live in China, you go on vacations elsewhere, and you buy supplements. You buy kiwis. You buy manuka honey to live a better quality of life. Unfortunately, I don't see the situation getting better anytime soon. But this is good for New Zealand. Bad for us in China, but it's good for you because, again, you're viewed as like nice people who are safe and clean. I think Not just, clean people, but like clean country, <laughs> clean environment. I mean, um, clean too. But. I think you've just given a very good explanation as to as to why we are seeing so much interest in property uh, from from China uh, into into Auckland and other parts because um, clearly it's it's often for practical reasons as well. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Very good. Uh, we've just got enough time for about one one quick question. If there's uh, yes. If there's anyone take yeah, we'll just get a microphone to you. I think. Have we got a microphones? Oh, there it is. The, uh, oh, sorry. the Economist reported recently that China has around 37 trillion US dollars in debt. What happens when that day of reckoning comes? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's not an easy answer. Okay, so the debt in China is definitely big, but there are a couple of reasons why I'm not overly concerned um, about a systemic risk. What I'm more concerned about is about sluggishness of the economy, something akin to Japan over the last decade or two. What you have is central government debt is only about... 50, 60 percent of the economy, while you have in like a Japan, it's about 200 percent. Mm. So there's a lot more room for the central government on the debt side, but it is an issue because we don't know how much it is on the local government side. That's one problem. The second problem, and I think, it, or one, second issue, is that most of the debt is still in state-owned banks. So it's not healthy, but what it means is the government can force the banks to roll over the debt over a 10, 20 year period. You're not going to get the same mark to market accounting that caused a lot of the panic and the fear in the United States in 2008 and 2009. That's not healthy, but it's all, it doesn't cause fear, which is what I'm most concerned about. And the Chinese are going to do what they did in 1997 when they ran into a similar debt problem. They took these bad assets and created new banks, and they just held them for 10, 20, 30 years and they start to sell it as a package to Westerners, okay? especially the American private equity firms like a Carlyle Group. What they'll do is they'll give you one good investment and they'll dangle nine bad ones. And what they'll say is, you can have this one good one if you buy these na nine bad ones and take the write-off. Now, the question is, will Western investors have the same trust in the technocrats that they did 10 years ago? I'm not sure. Because the last six months, confidence in the Chinese government has dropped precipitously, and it should. For the first time, and Westerners have always criticized the government, but for the first time I've been seeing elite Chinese criticizing the government because they've really created a crisis of confidence in the securities market and in the economic markets. It doesn't, we don't feel like they have a clue as to what they're doing. When it comes to debt, though, specifically, my biggest concern is the P2P finance because you have these new startups that are becoming $10 billion, $20 billion loan companies in a, in a year or two period, and a lot of people are concerned about them being Ponzi schemes. One of my friends set up a P2P bank, and in the first month after opening, he had already loaned out 300 million US dollars, and he already had 2,000 employees. And they're giving like 17, 18% interest. They're saying it's not guaranteed, but they're winking when the salespeople say that to the investors. So I'm more concerned on that causing a crisis rather than the central government or local government debt. All right, uh, please, uh, I'm sorry we have to cut okay. it there. Thank um, you. But, uh, but I'm gonna uh, ask you please to acknowledge and thank uh, Sean, and particularly for coming all the way from Shanghai too. Thanks very much.